We just want to apologize for the technical hitch. Uh, let me make sure that we are also on on uh, on Instagram. Yes. So uh, sorry about that. So next time this happens, what we are going to do, we will uh, I will call you and I will go live on Facebook directly, and uh, then we can finish the interview on on WhatsApp. Okay. No yeah. problem. Yeah, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sometimes these things happen. Uh, I was saying, uh, I did ask you if uh, it's like you're gone. Yeah, it's like he's gone. So what I guess uh, what we would do now is to have this interview directly on uh, WhatsApp and call his phone and uh, then have it like that. Because it looks like either the connection is not very good or uh, let's give it a little bit and see. I'm back, I'm back again. <laughs> I think it's it's the, I think it's the connection there. It's my the connection. My connection is is generally okay. It should not yeah. be the problem. I don't know what happened today. You know. But anyway, yeah. let's try again. If it fails, go on WhatsApp. Yes, like I said, if it fails, I'm just going to go directly on Facebook and then. Uh, um, call you on WhatsApp so we are able to do this interview. So we were talking about social security if it is owned by government. So my next question is, um, I do. I know you did an impressive job and we will come to that about at social security. Uh, but uh, what I uh, want to find out is a lot of people would say, with all that money that you're talking about that you, you got social security, the pensioners are still paid peanuts. I understand when you came, you did give them an increase, but uh, why is it that uh, with all the money that Social Security is talking about, the pensioners still don't have enough money? Yeah, uh, I think I think there are several factors. So probably there's a need to really understand. First, we need to understand the fund as it is today is in an actuarial deficit. As of 2014, when there was an actuarial valuation, there was a deficit of $518 million. Now, effectively, what that means is the fund's assets were not sufficient to cover the future liabilities of the fund. So there are two ways of doing it. You go back to the employers uh, who effectively bear the risk of any shortfall between the assets and the liabilities and pay additional contributions or pay lump sum payments. So effectively, as of 2014, the contribution rates would have been increased from percent to 20 percent of gross salary but it didn't happen mm -hmm. now so that that's one contributing factor now what social security has been doing in the past they've only been they've only been increasing pensions when there is an actuarial surplus so you actually need to have the assets more than the liabilities before they give a pension increase because if you don't you're just only going to increase that gap between the assets and the liabilities so that hasn't happened, and therefore there were no pension increases. So that's one factor. The other important factor is that pension is driven by your exit salary at the time of retirement. Mm -hmm. That is your pension. So if you actually exit an employment with a low salary, your pension is likely to start off a low base. You may then increase that the factors, the factors of increment every year if there is. Uh, so, so those two factors actually influence your level of pension and how often that pension increase. Now, I know where just before I left, we were working to say really in every part of the world, pensions are indexed. So you really try to cover the depreciation that arises as a result of inflation. So you kind of index it, that's one way of doing it. Uh, but it, 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 it's, it's something you have to be really very careful how you manage pension increase because you don't want to get to a situation where uh, you are insolvent. You do not have enough money to cover your pensions. You know? so, so I think that fund was in a very difficult situation, and that was a reason why increments were not possible. And that's just for the pension fund. You then have the provident fund, which equally as the pension, they were not getting any increases in interest. In fact, I believe from 2012, the rate of increase was 3%, and from there onwards, it has been dropping. And 20, from 2017, it was 0%, 2018, 0%. It is likely to be 0% also for the 2019 year ending. 
the reason for that, again, <clears throat> the Provident Fund has been making money in the last two years, and it will make money in 2019. But the problem is a lot of, the, a lot of money lent to central government or to the S other SOEs up to the tune of somewhere around 1.6 billion. This were the executive directives on the M. Now the likelihood of collecting that money uh, is kind of there were there were no there were no movement, no traction on this thing. So the auditors had to insist to do a provision on those things. So when you did that provision in 2016, that particular fund reflected a loss of somewhere in the tune of close to two billion mm -hmm. because of those. Now, with that kind of loss brought forward, you cannot pay any interest on until you clear out that deficit or government and all parastatals pay back the money. Mm. But there are instances when it is said that for, I think even before the Ramadan, it happened when they said the pensioners went to social security and they could not be paid. So what causes situations like that? where the old pensioners will have to uh, go all the way to Banjul and only to be asked to turn around that their money is not ready? No, no, no. I mean, if that happened, it would purely be an operational thing. Uh, because Social Security, as of now, is probably one of the most liquid institutions in this country. I mean, the Social Security has been deposited, even as of now, in excess of $2 billion. You know, So liquidity is not a problem. What happened around Ramadan and is really uh, taking, being conscious of COVID-19 and, and trying to avoid movement of pensioners from their respective residences to Banjul. So we kind of partnered with Yona uh, to allow pensioners to collect their pension from the nearest locations to them. So, so that kind of reduces their movement. But you know, when you have change, uh, that was the first time this happened. And uh, we were, on the papers, on the radios, and also even on telephone call with, with pensioners and pension associations to inform them of the change for that particular month. But not mm -hmm. every member was aware of the change on time. So some came to Banjul, but even when they came, the office tried to provide them with transportation to move them to various Yona offices so that they can collect their money. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't because of a liquidity, or it was really just logistical issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, and uh, you just said social security is one of the most, uh, is very liquid. You talked about that. Uh, but uh, I know when you came to social security, there's been uh, a lot of improvement. Uh, but people out there, critics would say, I mean, that is not your doing. They're saying that uh, because Jamme is not in the country again. So anybody you put as a security would be able to uh, do such a great job to make sure that uh, the institution is very liquid. So what did you do different? Because they're making it sound like, oh, no, no, it's, Jamme is not here. Nobody's taking from social money from social security, so anybody can do this. Yeah, well, people can claim that. I'm not, I'm not for one for a moment saying somebody else could not have what we did. Uh, but let me explain the Jamme effect. The Jamme effect stopped affecting social security since 2012 or 2013. You said it's so been because, No, stopped affecting Social Security okay. around 2013. Mm -hmm. Because from that point onwards, Jame mm -hmm. was not taking money away. Yes, he started taking money, I think, between 2011 up to 2013 or thereabout. But mm -hmm. that's when it stopped. So 14, 15, 16, Jame did not take any money out of Social Security. Mm -hmm. The fact if you look at 2016 and you look at 2017, so if, even if you go back to 2013, 2013, 14, 15, 16, and you look at the trajectory of our cost, our 2017 cost should have been, if we continued on that same trend, our 2017 cost would be somewhere around 302 million on the same trend. That's what it would be. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2017, our cost actually was somewhere around 178 million compared to the prior year when it was 271 million. So we actually break the trend and brought the cost down. Now, mm -hmm. doing that requires some very drastic actions. And those were not jammy effects. 
that I was actually trying being bold and taking some decisions that are not easy because you are actually trying to break a trend. And let me tell you, if that did not happen, the fund was trending in a place where it will be in a crisis. In fact, when we brought in the World Bank to do a mini actuarial valuation for us, they indicated that if we get the year 2020 without reversing that trend, the fund will be in a situation. Now, what do they mean by a situation? It means our, you know, our, our fund is a young fund, the Social Security Fund, the Gambia Fund is a young fund. Mm -hmm. It's a young fund in that you have more contributors than pensioners. Therefore, when you receive contributions and you pay out your pensions, and you, sorry, your pension obligations, and you also pay your, 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 your operational costs, you should have the leftover for, for the investment. But we were heading to a situation where our benefit payment and our operational costs will be more than the contributions we receive. Mm -hmm. That only in mature economies, not in growing economies like ours, not for a pension fund that has only been in existence under 40 years. That was, great. that was a crisis and it needed to be reversed. Our cost by the same uh, World Bank uh, uh, valuation was somewhere, I mean, this is, this is one of the metrics you use in a pension fund that uh, the, the <clears throat> cost to contribution ratio uh, was about 70% according to the World Bank exercise that they did in 2018 for the year 2016. Now, if you look at the OECD countries, the developed world and stuff like that, that cost or high income, middle income, that cost is somewhere around one to 2%. For low income countries, because of the structural problems we have and the challenges in, and, and because of the size of the, up to 10% is acceptable. We were running at 70%. Mm. So um, we all have seen how the Jane Commission, how uh, orders were made by former president Yaya Jame to take money from the Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation. So since you took over in 2017, did the government of Adam Abaro ever ask you for monies? No. They never ask you? No. Okay, so there's also a word that uh, they want you to, to, to buy buses. Uh, there's the allegations out there that this could also be one of the reasons why you removed, that you were asked to buy 200 buses, and this is different from the ones at GTSC. Is this true? That's, that's, uh, that's, that's speculative, and, um, but also I think it's important that uh, there are certain things which come to my knowledge because of my position. I think it would be unethical to discuss those things here. But one thing I can say, mm -hmm. one thing I is that uh, GTSC find the buses that they needed, and they bought 25 buses. They gave a loan to social to GTSC. Social Security gave 119 million dollars a loan to GTSC to buy 25 buses for GTSC's operations. Okay. And, yeah. So uh, the 200 buses, you're not going to comment on that? It's speculation. Um, I, it wouldn't make sense for me to talk on something that is speculative. Okay. So uh, is it also true that uh, uh, the, your, your office wanted to buy two vehicles and the Ministry of Finance said, we want you to buy this through TK Motors? Are you aware of anything like that? We had no plan to buy any vehicles. We bought vehicles in 2018, and we bought them through through, through competitive bidding through G, uh, GP, using GPP rules, and they were purchased from TK Motors, I believe. Okay, so is there any any uh, do you have any differences? I mean, are we going to get into more other issues uh, later on? But I just want to make sure that I bring these things up. And later on, if people have questions, they can also text it to me. But uh, there's also speculations. I just want us to clear these things. I know some of this could sound a little bit petty, but you know how uh, what's on social media and how everything is. Everybody is talking about these issues. There's what that you have. A, you do not have a good relationship with the Minister of Finance. And there are speculations that this could be one of the reasons why you <laughs> because you personally picked up your phone in your office and called him and said, you need to come and pay your loan. I know loans are uh, things that are very confidential, but it's been out there that a lot of government officials have loans as well as security and housing finance corporation. So did you call him to say, come and settle your loan? 
first let me let me let me go back first and talk about uh, the, the the relationship um i am i am not aware that the finance minister has uh, disliked for me um, our relationship has always been cordial mm -hmm. and to one another and the relationship has always been professional um he was the line minister and the line minister uh, the line ministry has an oversight responsibility over social security in all my interactions with him <clears throat> i have not noticed any dislike now on a personal front you know um and in very different uh, circumstances when he was the gambian ambassador in the uae and i was then based in dubai as the chief finance officer under the africa's business he frequented my house on weekends and we had many meals together in my home uh, since then we have had no reason to have any become enemies um so really i there's no personal animosity as far as i know between me and him now regarding his dealings with social security or lack thereof uh, i think it would be irresponsible for me to be discussed because it's a confidential matter okay so you won't be able to tell us if you called him or not that's confidential no i mean those are those are taken reason purely because of my position regarding an individual so whether it happened or not whether he has a whether he has any business to do with social security or not i think it will be improper to discuss that here. it will be unethical and unprofessional okay um that's uh, understandable and um also your deployment to the foreign affairs to the senegalo uh, secretariat a lot of people there were, there were divided opinions about this because uh many people said they have no 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 issue to deny that you did very well in your position but others also were saying it was a political appointment that when you came to Gambia from your retirement, you were already in Gambia. It was Amadou Sane, a UDP. Um, that time he was the Minister of Finance who handpicked you. And <coughs> there were speculations that you got that job because you are UDP. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I have I have had those things many, many, many times before. Let me let me say a couple of things. Um, I even not me. I believe all the MDs of um, parastatals uh, have been headhunted. I'll call it headhunted. It's not about handpicking. Headhunting is a very common thing, even in the West. Um, my, my job with Social Security when it started in Banjul, it was not through an advertisement or anything. I was headhunted. Mm. So headhunting is really not a state. But let's come back to this question about UDP. Um, I am not a registered member of the UDP. I am not. So let's clear that. Uh, do I have good relations with several party stalwarts and senior leaders, party leaders? Yes, I do. I do. And some of them are very distinguished. And I can clearly say they were also very instrumental in, the, in, the, in breaking down Jame and dictatorship. And I have nothing but admiration and respect for them, and in fact for everybody else who contributed in the downfall. But I am not a member of UDP. Now, as to whether I was hired because I am UP, again, it's speculation, but it cannot be true because, like I've said, I am not a UDP member. Now, I was appointed by the president. I think it's important to make that point clear. Mm -hmm. I was appointed. Now, clearly, there must have been recommendation. And it is likely that that recommendation came from the former Minister of Finance, who is a senior cadre of UDP. But I believe my performance over these last three years is a vindication that regardless of who recommended me, the president did appoint someone to head the social security who was able to achieve a significant return for the members. And I think at the end of the day, that is really what is important. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, um, so one would also wonder uh, a professional like yourself who does very, very well in all your uh, the uh, different institutions that you served, 
Uh, but your relationship with your staff, how is that like? Because I remember when we first came to the security, the Fatu Network, I think we were one of the first media groups to have an interview with you. And what the staff was saying, Manjang wouldn't even say hello to anybody. He would not even shake your hand. He would just walk past you just like that. Do you think that kind of contributed to the relationship you had with your staff, especially the last one? Well, it, it could, but um, I, I actually greet people. <laughs> well, you don't uh, shake their hands. I, I actually shake hands. You cannot be that, not be shaking hands. It's just not possible. That is what, who we are. We shake hands. If you ask even with uh, um, my former uh, employer, Standard Charter, when I was here in Standard Charter, I remember I once came to Banjul with um, uh, one of the guys who worked for me, who was responsible for, he was responsible for West Africa, but based in Ghana. And we had a visit together to Banjul. Mm -hmm. When we got to the office, the security guard then, Mr. Party, uh, came out to embrace me. And this guy is an Indian guy. He was with me and he was shocked because he was saying, I cannot believe that this is how casual you guys can be. You know, and now if you go to anybody now, um, sometimes, you know, uh, I am not perfect. I suddenly, uh, just like anybody, I wouldn't say I am perfect. I wouldn't say I have not done things that I could have done differently. Uh, um, because when you want to introduce culture in a system where certain behavior has been entrenched for quite a while, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. And, and so maybe I could have been much more sensitive to dealing with some of those things. But to say I do not greet or I do not shake hands, I mean, I know that are personal uh, stuff because some people uh, can be antisocial, but it's just that in the in our society, how it is in Gambia, because those are some of the some of the stuff that the staff said. Uh, you know, uh, issues that they they have with you. They did they did mention that that you wouldn't say hello to anybody. But these are not, um, you know, it has nothing to do with one's performance. But uh, there's all the, there are also speculations. I don't know if that's what you will call it. That you will go into the office and you will find this juju, safolo, tere, and all of that in your office. Did that ever happen? There was a time I heard you had to walk all the way to Albert Market to buy new shoes. No, I did not walk to Albert Market. Somebody bought shoes for me. It was a slipper. So what you happened know? to your shoes? Uh, well, I went to pray. And, uh, uh, one a pair went missing. So <laughs> I, but, but the next day I went to continue praying. So you went to pray at the, is it the mosque at the, at the office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, a pair of your shoe got missing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you, you didn't find it again the next day? No, it went, that was it. <laughs> it was never found. I mean, that was it. <laughs> so do you, do you think those are some of the things, what, what do you think that was? I mean, was it because they didn't want you there and they were trying to do all these things and take them to the marabou? You know, some people believe in that. Do you think that was what it was? What was the yeah. first thing that came to your mind? Well, nothing came to my mind. My shoe went missing. It was hot. I bought another one and came back. Came back the next day with another. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. <laughs> nothing came to your mind. No, it, didn't, it didn't really bother me. I mean, frankly, I mean, people can take the shoes as many times. I mean, I will come with them every day if they choose to take it. They're cheap, fortunately. You know, they're the fifty dollars. Is it the fifty dollars one? So okay. it was. <laughs> Wow. Wow. But so um, there's another thing that I want to ask. Yeah, yes. You, were you saying something? I'm, saying I'm not being naive. I understand why people will do because clearly uh, this unfortunately are some of the beliefs here, but not that it really bothers me much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's another thing that uh, recently I listened to an audio interview of a former staff of social security, one camera. And um, uh, he did say that uh, he, he kind of like accused you of being corrupt and all of that. 
and said, if you were not corrupt, how come that uh, the commission that was set up, uh, you know, when he was removed and you were suspended, they did ask you to make some payments. So he was saying, if he was not corrupt, how come he was making these payments? Because he was talking about authorities, but also using the money. Are you corrupt? <laughs> I, I am not corrupt. I am not a thief. Hmm. You know, um, I... You know, I have been in social security for, um, what, three years. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things happen. I think all these things that people reference, the allegation they keep making, is that I took a trip to Freetown. Yeah. And, uh, and there was a per diem paid about 100,000 plus. And that is what is referenced as corruption. Now. The reason people claim it is corruption, because there is a requirement that when you are traveling, you need to get clearance from Scott. Now, I had no intention of going to Freetown initially. I had zero intention of going to Freetown. Uh, but Freetown, we had a very cordial relationship with Freetown, and they were inaugurating their uh, tribunal and specifically invited me to go there to do two things. One, to do, uh, to do a speech, and of course, we had a tribunal well before them, and we were going to go with the Commissioner of Labor. I clearly said I'm not going. The Commissioner of Labor applied for court clearance and he was given a clearance. He was going on our invitation. I was in Senegal and strangely enough for a Senegal or Gambian secretary at meeting. And, and that is what I was doing in Senegal. And then I had a call from the PRO to say, listen, I think it is important that you attend this so the padiam was organized and given, but clearly there was no clearance. In the regulation, there is no requirement for squad clearance. I know it's a practice introduced during Yaya Janme's time, but it's really not a requirement. But still I went. Now, the commission and everybody who is talking about is saying, because I did not get the clearance, therefore it was improper for me to go. That day I could not even get my flight to Freetown and the flight was canceled. So, but I stayed in Dakar because there was no available flight to come back. And I spent some days in Dakar, came back to Banjul, and clearly they are saying, because you did not go to Freetown and because you did not get Scott clearance, that money, every what these people are accusing me, that's what they are calling as corruption. Mm -hmm. The commission also looked at it. Again, it's the same thing, it's, but you needed to get clearance, you did not have clearance, said fine, it's okay. We settled the money, I settled the money. 100,000. But remember, in that same period, I stayed here for about two months, did not go to work. Those same two months, my salary and the benefit that accrued to me was about 100 and something thousand, was actually even more than what this so called party. And I said very clearly, because I did not work, I don't need the money. Now, if I was so desperate for 100,000, would I leave a hundred thousand salary plus salary plus benefit for two months? And all the talk about corruption is about a hundred thousand. I mean, I'll be out of my mind. I have handled. I was in in um, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, starting a green side business there. Uh, three of us with over six million pounds with me. And I was managing it. There was no proper records, no documentation. I was recording it, and a time didn't go missing. So you wouldn't take a hundred thousand. It doesn't make. Okay. So if what happened? How, how how is it if I'm corrupt? All the people people are talking about is a hundred thousand. That's a part here. There are there. I'm sure there are better ways of getting money. Um, um, when you walk, there were times when people will, you see, corruption is not just about taking money. Corruption is even about taking gifts that are un unreasonably high is corruption. So you, you were not taking gifts as well? Absolutely not. What happened to the dinner at Cocoa Ocean? We said you, you were asked to refund that as well. Some are saying somebody misled you and say, oh, you can use this. And then you realize that uh, that's not how it should be. No, no, no. I, no. Cocoa Ocean dinner. No, I, I'm not sure it was refunded. I don't think it was. Mm. I don't think okay. 
Yeah, because this guy mentioned that. Okay, so that wasn't refunded. Um, also, there are also allegations that you uh, you have some media houses on um, payroll. Is that true? Just to, I mean, just to clear some of these things, and then we will uh, come back. Uh, but just, these are things that I I, I think we, I should ask. Um, Sorry, media houses on payroll. Yes, because uh, Kamara mentioned that uh, the Modu Kamara guy. Uh, he did an interview recently, uh, and then he did mention that you have some media houses on payroll. That is the reason why they don't uh, talk about uh, uh, everything, the mismanagement and everything that's that's happening at Social Security. I well, then then the media houses will be very unprofessional and unethical. If we are paying them to be quiet, then frankly, then they are not worth their salt. Mm. Yeah, I think about that too. So uh, the president, President Barrow, what is your relationship with him? Uh, have you been meeting him, talking to him about what you're doing? Uh, I mean, professional relationship. Do you have any with him? Well, my reporting relationship is through the ministry. The ministry is the line manager. Sorry, is the ministry has responsibility for managing social security, not, not the president. So you were dealing more with the with the social security with the uh, Ministry of Finance, more. Yeah, yeah. But like I said from the beginning, you know, social security is very different from other parastatals in that it's a custodian of funds for the membership. Mm -hmm. Government relationships should really be more regulatory. I mean, that is what it should really be. And the way the governance structures are in place, your primary point is the board of directors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, this, this um, it's it's very good that we are talking about some of these allegations, so that uh, you know it will be clear on the minds of those who have doubts. Uh, sometimes this may sound like uh, you know uh, some small talk, but it's also important, especially this social media era where uh, when you were deployed. There were a lot of talks and others were saying, oh no, he's a very professional guy, he shouldn't be moved. And others were thinking, because you are UDP, that's why a lot of UDP people were supporting you, even though they know. So why didn't you take up, you did explain your reason that uh, uh, that's not uh, an area where your professionalism lies, uh, but do you have any regrets over taking that? And what are you going to be doing now? Like, it must be hard, like, and, and a little bit boring, especially if you're used to working really hard. Um, well, to, to, your, to, your, to your first question, um, uh, let, let, me be, let me be clear. I, I always knew that I was appointed by the president and that, you know, I serve at his pleasure. I have never any doubts about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the president feel at this point in time, it's time for me to move on. So I move. Now, coming to the Senegal Gambian Secretariat, <clears throat> like I've said in my uh, letter declining uh, that particular offer, I was very clear that uh, Senegal Gambian Secretariat, the skill sets required, I do not possess. But, I, but I, I just want to move people maybe to something that a lot of people may not be aware or may not even know. In my very early career when i just started uh, i was in my early 20s mid 20s when i just completed school i came to the gambia i started working then with gambia national insurance company which was a parastata GNIC. yes gnic um my dad bought me a bmw series which i was driving at that time uh, not alone by the way it was bought for by my dad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was working at GNIC and I was the head of finance at that age. I was the head of finance for that corporation. I had about 14, 15 people uh, under me. I had a personal office and a personal assistant. I worked in that role for about, about a year. Then it dawned on me that I do not have the managerial skills to run the place, that I was not ready for that job. You left. I quit the job. And then I went to work for the National Investment Board, at that time headed by Abdullah Baxter. Mm -hmm. 
the CEO. And Odunjai was my line manager. Momodu Odunjai was my line manager. I went from becoming a head of department to becoming a financial analyst. I went from having an office of my own to sharing an office with four or five other people. I went from managing people to managing nobody. I went from having a personal assistant to no personal assistant. I was not forced out of the job. I just felt I was not ready for it. And I, if I can do that at that age, with all the trappings of the office, why not now? If I feel I do not have the skill set. So this is not like the Wolof would say, this is not, it's not do bullet shaman. <laughs> you know? So maybe people may find this strange and stuff like that. Uh, maybe some might think I am angry. I am absolutely not angry. You know, when I went to this job, I went in because I thought I could get something back. You know, when I came here, I, I was quite comfortable. I could stay that way, but that would not make sense. So when I'm called to, to serve, I went to serve. When I'm told you are no longer required in this role, I take it in good faith. But I'm not going to a job that I feel I have competent in skills. You know, when I sat here, when I was on, 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 on leave, mm -hmm. I felt two months I did not work for, it would be immoral for me to take the pay. If I go to Senegal or Gambian Secretariat and, and, and be paid salary, I would not be, I will feel it is money that I have not earned and morally wrong today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that would take me to the question of you and the top management declaring your assets when you took over in 2017. Did that happen? Yes, I did. So you declared your, your asset. And when you were leaving, did you have to talk to anybody about that when you did the handing over to say, when I came in, this is what I came with, and now I'm going, I'm going with what I, what I you know, showed here, what I declared? I'm sure I'll probably go through the phase. I mean, I just completed that handover about two days ago. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. the, your successor, I, I am told that you know him. Do you trust him with your, like you said, um, you put social security in a, in a uh, sound footing. And I'm not going to say you tell me this because I know we've been going through stuff uh, under the, your, your uh, letter that you wrote to the government to say, this is how, this is what is happening at the corporation. I am leaving now. Do you trust <coughs> that uh, Mr. Tambidu will not be put under pressure to go to take social security back to Jamme days? Do you have an idea? Do you know if he's somebody who would just let go? Um, I, I know him. I know him fairly well. Uh, we have served together on the board of Trust Bank, Gambia. Uh, I, I, I find Tambedu to be very professional and competent. You know, I, I believe he is actually a very good choice as MD for Social Security. You know, I really believe that he is. Um, and I will count on him to do the right thing by the members. You know, and, and to tell you the fact, my expectation is he will do well. You know, he will do well because he has a very good executive team. The business he inherited is very liquid, is financially strong, and he has an extraordinarily solid foundation to build on. You yeah. know, and he has an incredible supportive board. You know, so I think all of those are ingredients for him to succeed. To the extent that that they can exercise their mandate without any interference yeah. and i do not expect to be there to be any interference so i think everything is set for him to succeed and i i have every confidence that he will i mean he's professional and very competent yeah and to be fair to him uh when he was at the gpa i heard he did very well at the gpa 
So um, like I said, during uh, the interview that I had when you were deployed, I said we would be watching to see what he will be, uh, what he will be doing at the social security and uh, we will be following up. I saw the handing over uh, when you handed over to him and uh, the picture, it was very cordial. It looks like the relationship is uh, very good and, and that's a good thing because most of the time when people are deployed or they, they're not happy, they're angry. It doesn't look like you're angry. <laughs> I am absolutely not angry. You're going to leave Social Security, a job that you like, a place that you like to work, a place that you work so hard to put on a sound footing. So you're still not angry, right? You wish him the best of luck and you're sure he can do it. I wish him every success. He is a very competent individual and he will definitely succeed in that role. I have no doubt on that. Now, but why would I be angry? In fact, um, <clears throat> Uh, I think I am, how would I put it? Um, I'm relieved, you know, I'm relieved in that, you know, um, clearly when I left the time I left, there are several thoughts that go through my mind. One of them is clearly relief. Uh, relief as this was a heavy responsibility and it has been an uphill task. You know, when you try to implement an institutionalized change with a challenging context, you're really confronted with a number of issues. You know, force is really dealing with culture that has been entrenched in the organization for quite a while. And it is very much in keeping with the strong Gambian sentiment that if it belongs to government, then it does not belong to my father. And why should I stop it if, you know, why should I stop? The typical Gambian mentality is, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, so now the fact that the government does not own one put in SHFC funding is completely lost in the debate, you know, so, so that, that is, that, that is one of the challenges for me. Now, second, because our environment, which makes it normal to use corporate funds, <clears throat> to benefit the government or indeed uh, without going to due process. If you want to correct that, it is always a problem. You will face some serious battles. Now, let me tell you right now, uh, perhaps uh, I have no certainty, but perhaps some corporations, or in fact, even some individuals, uh, government will be giving out quantities of money for, um, you know, uh, either sugar or buying two, in any other environment, this kind of thing will raise, you know, I certainly would not have used COVID funds to give Ramadan sugar also. Yeah. You know, we all know salaries of public and public officials, depending on grade, but for quantities of money to be spent on public largesse, trying to impress and buy people should normally be questioned, but it is not. Yeah, because the staff did mention that they were performing the Hajj on Social Security. Social Security was paying for a certain number of staff to go to Mecca, and they were given Ramadan sugar and Ramadan rice and all of that, and you cut all of that off. I think that's one reason why they were not happy with you. Yeah, I, 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 I personally believe it was not our right to be doing this with people who have worked for over 40 years or so and to be forced to compulsorily save money and not really getting any benefits. I think we should first and foremost satisfy the needs of those people and only then go on. I mean, every stakeholder should get a benefit. There's no doubt about that. And like I said, you know, like this year, at least in the budget, uh, I don't know how, what will now happen, but in the budget, we had put a provision of somewhere around 35 million for performance pay. Wow. And this went through, in fact, we had a discussion with the president's office on this, um, and I think uh, it is for intents and purposes approved. And we were going to reward staff based on performance. So there will be, and, and I think that was what it was all about. It is not about individualizing. You see, for few people to benefit, I think in an institution, every member of staff should benefit if the institution delivers. That is the culture I have been used to. And I think it pays in places that have implemented it. And I think that is what we also implement to actually 
encourage people to deliver on performance. Well, like I, yes. Like I was saying on just the, I mean, you know, if you take, if I take a page from Yaya, yeah, I mean, Yaya used to boast here of how rich he was. And few asked the question that this guy was a soldier, became president, his salary was known. How did he become? Now, I, I take myself and said, as an expatriate for many years, just as much, almost as long as Yaya has been in power, I had all the benefits of Yaya. I had free house, I had free school, I had a free car, I had a free medical treatment, and I had a free business class. And I was paid a salary many, many times more than Yaya. And yet, I cannot, in my wildest dreams, accumulate the kind of wealth he did in that pretty much the same period of time. And you still see civil servants, some civil servants, display this kind of thing today. I, for one, will not celebrate anybody or envy anybody in public service who is spending money like that because, I mean, it cannot be clean. So have you seen any doing that in this regime? I know Jamie's time it happened. So have you seen anything like that in the Baro regime too, Baro Baro's government? Well, I, I, I think um, some of these things is obvious to everybody. I mean, it's not about whether it's not about, it can be every, everywhere. You see, what I find strange uh, sometimes in this country, see like when you go to the nationals for uh, they have a gift policy, for example. So if you give me a gift which is maybe worth five pounds or ten or twenty dollars or thirty dollars, it's accepted because that cannot corrupt you. That cannot make you do anything in favor of something. But when you are given a gift of certain value, even running into a couple of hundreds of pounds or dollars, you must declare the gift. Not only declare the gift, but you have to surrender the gift to the institution. Now here, we take that as the packs of the office. Yeah. Now we may not be taking the money, but we, we refer to the packs of an office. It is not, a, it is actually corruption. Yeah. You know, so when people do kind of things, not considered, but it is. And I think it is not only about the officer, but it's also about us as citizens. Until we get to the point of recognizing that this is not on, we will, you know, if you, if you caught a thief who goes at night and, and breaks into your house and take your TV, which is probably worth maybe 50, 60,000, if he survives a beating, he's lucky. Mm -hmm. He'll be dragged to the police. He will probably go with broken hands stuff like that. We are marvelous when it comes to that. But when it comes to the big ones, we celebrate. Yeah, because I was going to say, uh, when Jamme was here, one thing was clear. I mean, a lot of people would say he's the one who would do all the corruption. A lot of uh, other government officials, they are not, because he would um, say he was going to lock them up and all the kind of threats will come. But it looks like now uh, people are not very scared about what comes, because nothing happens, nothing comes out of it. Recently at the National Assembly, I don't know if you've been watching the issue about the vehement when money was moved and the National Assembly thought that that wasn't right, that before that happened, the Ministry of Finance should have informed the National Assembly, uh, but they're saying, oh, this is how we, we used to do it. And that ve this vehement talk is a lot of talk. Do you think it is fraud or do you think it's normal? for the Ministry of Finance. I'm just asking your opinion in this as a Gambian. You think it's right for the Ministry of Finance to just move money anyhow they want without getting the National Assembly members involved? Well, somebody, not, wrote, somebody wrote that it's, it's normal, it's very good, it's fine. I, I don't know the exact details of the constitution on the matter. Mm -hmm. um, I think the parliamentarian should be better placed to know what the constitution says. But one thing we must do as a strong institution is something is in variance with the laws of the constitution they need to act it's not about talking you know it's about taking action it's the only way we need to strengthen institutions to make sure we have a viable democracy and that is driven i mean i know in in this country of ours there's always a lot of talk 
which is good. But talk does not solve anything. Talk does not move anything. It's actually actions that make a difference. I think it is okay to talk, but we must get to a point we start taking action. Now, it's be, it will be difficult for me to comment exactly on this because I have the details. Yes, I, I understand. I reference to the, I think, Public Finance Act, and I had the parliamentarians making reference to the Constitution. Yes, I know very clearly the Constitution takes precedence over any all the laws in this country uh, but clearly i i have not had the opportunity but i'm not a lawyer i'm a layman i have not had the opportunity to look at the constitution neither the act the minister is referring to so to avoid just making a comment for the sake of a comment i all i can say is whatever it is we need to make sure that the laws of the land are respected and if mm -hmm. the laws are respected that is fine that is what we must ensure and if we ensure that, then we will be doing the right things. Just to remind the viewers that I am having an interview right here with Mohamed Manjang. He was the managing director of the Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation. I know Musa Jeng is waiting to interview you. He was like, don't ask all the questions, but I can tell you he's the finance guy. So when you go to his interview, he will have all the finance uh, questions for you. Uh, when it comes to financial discipline, I hope he'll be kind, you know, I mean, what was that? I, I hope he will, I only hope he will be kind with me. Yes, because he is a finance guy, so he is ready with all his questions waiting for you this weekend. Uh, but uh, as a finance guy, uh, how would you assess the borough administration's discipline when it comes to finance? You know, because as a Gambian as well, I'm sure you'll be paying attention to this. Yeah, yeah, I do, I am. But you know, it's a very tricky question. Mm -hmm. You know, um, tricky in the sense, if I rate high, it will be like, mm, maybe he's interested in something. If I rate low, it will be, mm, maybe he's angry with the government. <laughs> That's true. Ask me this question. Uh, maybe three months down the line, my yes. people will not be claiming I am angry. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand that. I understand because each time I say something that I'm not happy with, they're like, oh, because you don't have a job with the government. That's why. So I understand that <laughs> how our people, some of our people think. But let me now ask you about um, a sister of mine who I would not call a friend because we've been, you know, friends since 1998, I think. And that's uh, the the director of admin, I think, at Social Security, Mama Ligel. There's been a lot of talk that the reason why she got this job is because she was defending you, that this was the reason why you just took the job on a silver platter and gave it to her. Is this the case? That she didn't go through all the right, uh, you know, the process and that she was hired on the phone? I don't have authority to hire that level. Uh, the authority of the MD to hire is actually almost at a junior level. Um, I believe beyond grade five or so, it has to go to the first one. Number two, during my time, I haven't really hired anybody because I thought we had enough people on the board. So I haven't hired anybody under my, uh, that fell under my authority. Now, with regards to MAMA, um, we actually have a board subcommittee that does interviews on which sits the chairman of the board as the chair of that subcommittee. I am only a member of that subcommittee and you have two other board directors as members of that subcommittee. That is the committee that interviewed the direct, the, all the applicants for the director of HR. Yeah. And is the collective scores of the members of the that tallies to award a job to an individual. And those scores are based on various metrics from the qualification to experience and the character of the individual. I wasn't even aware that she was supporting me over the crisis because frankly speaking, and to be very frank with you, I wasn't really paying much mind to what was happening in those period. Then I will go insane. Why would I be following the media? I was only focused on the job at hand. <laughs> yeah, it's a, social media is, it can be a big distraction. Trust yes. me. Yeah. So did, uh, did the social security uh, bought her a house and also a car? Uh, I am not, I have not seen her application for a 
house. So, and if I have not seen it, then it did not happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you didn't see any application for applying for a house? Now, for her, every member of the category is entitled to a car loan. And I believe she also falls in that category. And all, all staff who are within that category uh, have gotten cars. I don't think it was any special favor mm -hmm. for her. In fact, in her case, I think she only got a car after six months or so. Mm -hmm. Six months of working with uh, Social Security. There was absolutely no special favor, uh, either at the time of her recruitment or for any facility or benefit you got whilst in employment. Mm. So the three reasons why um, they said you are deployed, one, you are Mandinka, two, you are UDP, three, you have an issue with uh, the finance minister. So you're saying no to all of that. You don't think those are, do you think these three contributed? You know, well, sometimes guess, we would we would just uh, think about stuff and say, oh, maybe yes, maybe it could be A, B, C, and D. Do you think it's all these three or no? You just took I, it in. I, I can tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. I was not given any reason as to why I was deployed. So anything I say will be speculation. Like I told you, I don't want to get into speculations. All I can say is I am very clear that I was appointed by the president and I served at his pleasure. He felt it was time for me to move on. And the press release I saw is for, I guess, uh, how, how was it phrased? For performance improvement or, or something along those lines. So if I am to give a reason, that is the only reason I can give you. Now, coming back to the other points, I told you my relationship with the minister is very cordial. Uh, we had a relationship prior to this job. Uh, which was when we were based, or both based in the UAE, and we had a very cordial relationship. Like I said, he frequented my house many times. Now, being a Mandinka, I mean, I, I, I am not aware that that in itself is a qualification or is for getting a job. <laughs> so, so I am, I am, I am not aware of that. So maybe, so, so it cannot. That cannot also be a reason. Okay, so it's not also because you are the, you are the board chairperson of the the uh, trust bank, the home finance, the gun petroleum uh, institutions, organizations that are very all very liquid. You don't think it's also a way of uh, moving you so they can um, have access to the funds? Um, uh, trust bank is a regulated institution, and uh, the money they carry belongs to the depositors. It is not trust banks money. And there are very clear regulations from central bank as to how money moves out of any bank, not just trust bank, but any bank in this country. Because if a banking system has a problem, that will be detrimental for the economy of this country. So I don't think me being chair or not makes any difference. There. Now for GAM Petroleum, uh, GAM Petroleum has got private shareholders and they are bought regulates the affairs of GAM Petroleum. Um, payment of GAM Petroleum, because it has very limited use for cash, it almost pay out 80% of what it generates as dividends to shareholders, and of which Social Security is one of them. I probably should add here that um, uh, in the month of January, um, we increase Social Security. You have to excuse me, I'm saying we, I, am, I should be using the past tense, but anyway, Social Security is its holding in GAM petroleum by about 14.32 percent. We bought 250 million dollars worth of shares in GAM petroleum in December 2020. Now we still have a 2.1 billion dollars in time deposits and treasury bills, even as a match of this. Year. Okay. So uh, the questions that I'm getting from the people, I just want to take just one question from there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I know the kind of issues they're raising here. You did say these loans are confidential. You don't want to talk about them, but especially when it has to do with an individual, <coughs> somebody is saying that uh, 
we should ask about camera and then he took a loan of uh, they said 3.1 million i know you told me that you don't want to go into loans because that's confidential right uh i mean you know um <laughs> it was funny because it's mr camera uh i know but that doesn't make it any difference mm -hmm. it, it will be unethical for me wow yeah so uh one of the um the viewers is also asking about i'm just going to take a little bit few questions from them before we let you go i know you have a, a whole lot of uh, interview weekend coming up so uh maybe some of the other issues will be discussed right there like i said the financial part musa jeng the expert will be waiting at for the people by the people uh where they would ask you all those uh questions but uh somebody did mention here that i should ask you um uh, that what's what's next for you what are you going to be doing next okay <laughs> well let's put it this way for now i am i am i'm at home waiting to hear from the government uh i was um i think if you if you recall i was i was removed from heading uh, social security yeah. and aside the Gambian secretariat yeah. to a role that i found uh, impossible to take up uh, i because i do not have the skills and experiences to do so so should the government require my services in a role more aligned to my skill set then i would be happy to take it up but in the event that no such role is available at this time, then I shall move on and resume my happy retirement. Now, I know a lot of people have been talking to me or have been speculating, uh, uh, will, what will I do? Will I just be staying home? No. You know, I do, even when I want to for social security, I actually do a lot of stuff. I actually try and help assist people, particularly young entrepreneurs who are trying to build their businesses. I try to help them put structure and I do that at pro bono, you know, so that occupies, that had occupied a lot of my time when I was not working for social security. So I can always resume in doing that. But then I have also reflected severally since I started work at social security and saw firsthand the amount of damage being done by some of our civil servants and people in public office. You know, on one hand, I am comfortable and surely tempted to enjoy my retirement. And on the other hand, my conscience does not allow me to be indifferent. You know, so I, 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 I hear this little voice in my head telling me, you know, you cannot be laid back. You cannot be. This is the only country I keep telling people, I do not have two passports. I have one passport. So I have nowhere else to go but the Gambia. So, you know, um, I will explore available opportunities to be of service. Okay. So somebody did mention that if, uh, that I should ask if, for instance, the president decided to, that he wants you to go back to social security like on Monday, like next week, are you going to go? Again, <laughs> it's, we, it's, it's a very hypothetical question. I think the guy who is in social security is fantastic for the job. For me, it's not about whether I go to social security or not go to social security. For me, it's delivering service to the country. Like I said, I think um, um, my conscience will not allow me uh, to just sit by. So if, any, if there is an opportunity, what is critical for me, that that opportunity must align to my skill set, must align to things that I can do. It's okay. not uh, getting up and going to an office for the sake of going to an office. No, I must be, must feel that I am adding value and I am productive. And whatever that is, I am very willing to serve the Gambia. Uh, but it has. To, if I don't feel like I'm giving service, like I told you, Fatu, if I can make that call twenty years ago when I'm building, when I'm building my career in a job that is really a dream job at the time. And I was willing to walk away from it because I felt I did not have the competence. I don't see what will stop me making that call again today. And do you have a political ambition? Do you want to be president of Gambia someday? <laughs> uh, 
that's a that's a big one you know i know people have said that but you know my thoughts on service had never ventured so far you know uh should Gambian people want me want this service from me it will be the most difficult decision for me to make personally and uh why why because um um i, I don't think that presidents in Africa are inherently corrupt. No, that's not what I think. You know, I, I don't think that. But I am aware uh, that in a democracy, <clears throat> you need to do what the people want for them to vote for you. And for now, in the absence of a clear appreciation uh, that a president is the servant of the people, you know, our electorate in Africa, and more importantly in the Gambia, uh, believe that the president is like, you know, Mansakewa, Mansakewa, President Mansakewa. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and he's a king. And therefore, the wealth of the whole nation is his. You know, he can imprison, uh, some can even kill. And people, you know, uh, People believe that, say, if we take loans in the name of the Gambian people as a president, he can spend it as he wishes. This pressure, this pressure is also on his cabinet and members of parliament. Therefore, I think the expectation um, is, in effect, for all government to collectively loot the coffers of, for, for, for public consumption and cheap popularity. Now, the question I'll be asking myself is, am I above that temptation? Will, yeah. I, be, will I be above that temptation? As president, can I handle the immense pressure from my government, ministers, or religious leaders? Remember, <laughs> Yaya, Yaya had support from the most unlikely of quarters, and his generosity with our money knew no bounds. You know, I, I tried my best in social security. I see how firsthand that felt, you know? So I'm not sure, I am not sure. I am prepared to handle such pressure. Uh, well, you're not sure, but uh, the options are open. If it comes your way and you feel you're ready at that time, you may want to do it. Is that yeah, what well, it For me, um, I have to, convince myself that I am prepared for this pressure. So I guess um, I have to be, uh, uh, to be prepared for the pressure to stop corruption in the country, trying to ensure that rather than squander the money, trying to impress the populace, that I put the money into good schools, good roads, help the women of the Gambia to get maximum benefit from their narcos, ensure that the hospitals have medicines and equipment, create job and entrepreneurship opportunities. I have to make sure that I, in my mind, that this is something I am willing and able to do, that I can withstand the pressure. So I guess what I'm telling you, mm -hmm. I can all honesty say, give you an answer to that question as I sit here. You will not be able to give an answer right now. Right now, I cannot give you Okay, and I'll, I'll take that, but uh, I told you that I promised that this interview was going to take an hour and it's, we're eight minutes over, so very soon we're going to end this because I know you have two other interviews so that uh, I'm sure they also have issues that they want to elaborate on. But uh, someone just sent this message and he said, I know he doesn't want to comment about the uh, economy for obvious reasons, but what is his take on potential closure of Banjul breweries? Is this not a dent on Burroughs' handling of the economy? <laughs> um, you see, I think we will certainly have, in my view, and uh, I am not, uh, I am not an economist. Uh, I think, I think we are headed for much bigger problems uh, economically. Uh, we are not immune to what is happening in the rest of the world. Uh, it may be delayed, but it will get here. So certainly, closure of uh, Banjul Brewers can only exacerbate that problem. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to see which other one I will take. I know there's a whole lot of questions that I may not be able to ask all of this. Um, you know, also people commenting, talking about different things. And one issue that another person raised right here is to ask you about Aisha. They said, this is somebody who, uh, when she was given that uh, scholarship or uh, whatever it is for her to go to Ghana, they said already the board was, the board said, no, we're not going to allow this anymore. And then you decided to waive it and give it to her. Is that a fact? No, that's not a fact. The, but see, let me let me again comment on this, and I'll take from my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. I know um, in our institutions, I mean, there's always reference to Aisha, but there was Aisha, and there was uh, there was another guy mm -hmm. uh, who went. Uh, again, uh, when I joined Standard Chartered Bank in the Gambia, um, they don't train people based on the number of years you have been in the bank. I know this is a culture in parastatals. It is not necessarily a good culture in my view. When I joined Standard Chartered Bank, I was among the very first people, not just Standard Chartered, but certainly Standard Chartered Group, to be put on an executive MBA program with one of the top management colleges in the UK. I was pretty new in Standard Chartered. I wasn't even more than one and a half years in Standard Chartered. I met people who have been there much, much longer than I have. They have served the bank far more than I have. I joined along with people who were also qualified academically, but I was selected because at the time, they do this identification of potentials and they see a potential an individual and believe you have runway. So you have potential, you have runway, and you are selected to go on a training. And that I have seen yielding significant dividend in the institutions that I've interacted across the world, uh, with, because with Standard Chartered, I had the opportunity to really travel to a number of countries in Africa, Middle East, Asia, and Europe. And, and I have seen this demonstrated over and over and over again, and it has yielded significant dividend. I really don't see why we cannot adopt such things of identifying people with high potential mm -hmm. and with wrong way to go and really invest in them. It's an investment. Okay. So somebody wants to know if you will remain as chairman of Trust Bank. Is that also going to go? Um, I'm sure it will go because it will um, to the MD. I am on. Well, it's not necessarily automatically MD Social Security becomes chairman of Trust Bank. Wow. As and uh, nominated by the board, it's not. It's not automatic. You are chair. You are Social Security. The chair is yours. That's that's not how it goes. And then it has to go through the approval process of the central bank because it is a regulated institution. Mm -hmm. But I am on the board of Trust Bank. I am nominated by uh, uh, Social Security. So I guess if I am not in Social Security, then I will not continue on the board of Trust Bank. Okay, so uh, is there anything that you would want to add? Because I think it would be fair uh, to uh, uh, let you go. It took like a, an hour already, and I know Musa Jeng told me clearly <laughs> that he wants to be able to ask his questions. Uh, he's warming up for you, and I know it's not going to be easy on Sunday. I don't know if you know about that. <laughs> no, you're worrying me now. So. <laughs> No, because he called me yesterday. I'm like, but why do you have to interview him before me? I said, don't worry. You are the finance guy. So you will have, uh, you know, all those questions that you want to ask him. Uh, but yes, I think uh, for my end, I know people have still have their questions, but uh, um, did he have any conversation with the finance minister about the procurement of buses? We talked about that. He said, these are all speculations. I think this person didn't tune in on time. They're still asking about the buses. Uh, if the Ministry of Finance asks you to buy buses for the government. Let me put, let me put this thing. Let me put that GTSC is 100% owned by Social Security. Social Security, yes. 
not, it is not a government property, it is a social security property. Mm -hmm. So decisions in terms of buying buses really should be is social security. When we bought 25 buses, like I said, uh, because the board of GTSC and the, sorry, the management on the board of GTSC determined that that was needed. Fleet was down by some 60%. Sorry, we are, we, they were operating at 60% 60, 60 level because of the age of the buses. So that is the level they were operating. So it was a, 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 a very detailed analysis was done to conclude that 25 buses were needed. The routes identified both international and local and also for private hire to get to that 25 and that was funded. So uh, that's where we are. Okay. So um, I'm just going to ask uh, two more and then that will be it. We can let you go. I know it's after iftar, but I have 29 minutes to iftar. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> what oh. measures, huh? No, no, go on, go on. Yeah, what measures are put in place to monitor progress of social security? Do, do you know, uh, have you put any measures in place to monitor progress? For these pensioners who are saying, oh, my jambi and do latala no sign do be kela nyadile. <laughs> are there any any uh, pro, did, did you put in uh, place any measures you know you know the you know what gambia in most institutions uh, to, by and large the problem is not having systems or or or, or, or a regulation i wouldn't say system it's not about lack of regulation to a large extent it's just really about enforcing them i did not put any new all the things i was doing it's not like I put new regulations in place. But yes, we are, we, well, um, there was work done on a number of things that are put in. Uh, for example, um, we, we, in terms of uh, monitoring performance or service delivery, uh, we have kind of put in place um, um, a workflow system, uh, which ensures that we can track when things are put into the system to the point they leave the system. So we can understand how long they have taken every process point to either improve or make sure that anybody can pick up a phone and tell you if you have a claim, it is at this stage or is it at this stage. I think there's enough discipline now within the organization uh, to make sure that uh, uh, investments are done timely, uh, that we monitor the performance and that we are very effective now in the way we monitor the, 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 um, the um, how do we call it again, the inspectors in terms of enforcing compliance, in terms of collection of um, contributions. You know, so employers are very mindful and actually paying their due time. So I think those things are now in place. I think we are certainly far better in doing uh, some, but not, not so much that we have put any new things in place is really just about enforcing uh, and being being really strict and firm on how we do things. Okay, so now that you left Social Security and we talked about people having loans there, which you said you don't want to discuss, do you have a loan there yourself? And if yes, how are you going to service it now that you're out? Uh, I do not have. <laughs> you don't have loans there. I have never never taken a loan. No. I don't need. Yeah, I didn't hear that part, sorry. I said I do not need it, so I have never taken mm, You don't need any loans. So um, I guess this will be the um, the last one. Like I said, it's uh, about 26 minutes to iftar uh, at my end right here in Florida. And um, I just want to ask, there's a lot of uh, speculations, and I'm going to say allegations. I keep saying this. A lot of corruption allegations uh, with the Gambia government. I mean, these are things that we can, nobody, none of us can prove. Uh, sometimes people would call us all kind of names and say the journalists don't investigate, but you cannot bring what's, what you, you know, you don't have evidence for. So um, what do you think would be the best way? For instance, if there is corruption or there is no corruption, what do you think would be the best way to get rid of corruption? Like to talk to people, what to do, like the best practice? Well, um, you know, is it about lack of regulations? No, I, you know, sometimes um, I, I sometimes say, why, why don't we use, I think we have, we, have, we have some things in place that we can, we can, we can really pursue to, to, to regulate some of these things. Um, 
I think it has to be collective effort. It's really not just about people perpetrating these things, but it is also about uh, the populace. You know, we, you know, it is very interesting that we celebrate crooks. That's the reality. You know, um, we, so until we really recognize that these people, uh, we understand the effects of corruption, the fact that we do not have medicines in the, in the offices, the fact that we have potholes on our roads and cars are constantly in accidents, the fact that people are dying, the fact that your, school, your kids are going to school and not getting proper education is because Mr. Y is taking things that do not belong to him. And until we collectively recognize that and stop celebrating these people, it will always be a struggle. So I think that is important. So we need to be sensitizing people to understand the effects of corruption. We have to people tell us, so people have to stop saying that uh, um, uh, in Mandinka, you know, so I think then we have to enforce, put anti-corruption laws in place and make sure we have strong institutions and that people within those institutions are also strong. But we also need to make sure we are not compromising people. You cannot put me in a job and pay me $200 and expect me to police $1 million. Mm. You know, so, but it's always difficult, which comes first. Do you pay before productivity or is it productivity before pay? Whatever it is, there has to be, those two have to be in sync. Otherwise we will forever continue with this struggle. And it is always going to be detrimental for our country. Do you own any businesses in Gambia? For instance, one that sells land to the security? <laughs> I, I have seen, uh, I, I'm told, somebody was telling me, in fact, the owner of that particular business was telling me, apparently. <laughs> so I was telling him, I said, my friend, how come I have shares in your company? I'm not aware of it. You better give me my share. Now, but let me, let me be serious. I mean, this is a young Gambian guy. Uh, who set a property uh, business called Solid Solid Properties. I, I have absolutely no stake in Solid, uh, but I used to help them to try to put structure in place well before I even joined Social Security. Like I said, I was helping people uh, pro bono uh, to help them establish and set themselves because really um, it is only small and medium-sized enterprises that you can really generate significant economic growth. And that is what I was doing. Uh, but, you know, even tough global or, 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 or global properties are not in the same league as social security. How can they compete? You know, social security did not do any land projects recently in Congo simply because it did not have land. And if we want to buy land, uh, there's so much uh, uh, issues around purchasing land from Kabilos that really, if you go into it without government intervention, it is only going to be problematic. Uh, we had land during the Ajame time, uh, or Social Security had land during the Ajame time in the Kadhi industrial estate, which was taken by the then government and we were going to be reallocated land around Jambanjeli area, which we intended to put up social housing. Uh, but that process is still ongoing and it's not yet completed. And that is why that did not happen. Uh, so the only place uh, that social security was intending to do housing was in Nagang around Basin. But to your question, no, I do not own any businesses. Gambia. So, I started, yes. I, in solid. I, I would be very happy though if they give me some shares. <laughs> so, now a little bit about who Manjang is outside of your uh, professional work. Uh, you were born in Banjul. Can you tell us a little bit about you outside of professional work? Uh, let me, let me, let me, let me just say I am, I'm a Gambian, born and bred. You know, I'm a true, true Gambian. Like I said, I have never been interested in acquiring any passport except that of Gambia. <laughs> uh, my late father of blessed memory, 
uh, was Alhaji Bora Manja, uh, an old fashioned disciplinarian. Uh, I'm sure, Fatu, you are from T Road, so I'm sure. I know, yes, I know your house. And now I'm wondering, because you used to have Gamos there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, so who instilled in my sibling and I certain foundational values? You know, values such as accountability, uh, discipline, humility, and respect. Uh, this is some of the foundational values he uh, instilled in us. Uh, he hailed from Brikamanding in the Central River region. Um, I am married and blessed with two beautiful children. And I. They're twins, right? Yes. And I did my studies in the UK. Uh, I returned to the Gambia after a brief stint. I worked in the UK for about a year. And then I came, I joined public service, like I told you, for a short period with GNIC and NIB. I have already told you the story of how I moved from GNIC to NIB. I uh, told you who, uh, where I was, I was, I was working, working on that. <clears throat> so um, that is, that is my early, my early, 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 early uh, career. I was then, I then moved to the private sector. This is probably after uh, two years or so, three years in total working NIB and the uh, Gambia National Insurance. Like I said, I was probably one of the very first people headhunted in the Gambia to join Standard Chartered. I never applied for a job in Standard Chartered. I was actually headhunted by the then managing director of Standard Jada because he was he was friends. Um, I was seconded by NIB to a World Bank sponsored project to privatize uh, GPMB, and I was seconded to work there. I went initially with Odunjai, then Odu went back and I stayed. Uh, I stayed and worked with the World Bank team and that World Bank team who told Standard Jada about my performance, and then I was headhunted by Standard Chartered. And in fact, at the same time, NIB promoted me to the position of financial controller. Uh, but, you know, I guess they're trying to retain me. But, you know, uh, I, I don't know. For some reason, I felt it's an opportunity to work in the private sector. So I went there. Now, my career in Standard Chartered Bank led me to a number of senior roles in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. And at the time of my, um, my early retirement, <clears throat> I started five years as the chief financial officer for the Africa region and uh, responsible for uh, a, a number of countries. Uh, but I'm not really going to go into details of uh, uh, that because then, then this interview will be extended again and probably that's not what we desire. Because I lived in about uh, seven countries over that period at some very senior executive levels uh, uh, for many countries, including the Gambia, uh, the bank generally was the dominant bank and, uh, and, and, and probably the first in a number of them. Like I told you, I'm a, I'm a practicing Muslim uh, and I take my religion and its tenet absolutely serious. You know, I have a family uh, that what we do in this world <clears throat> we shall account for it in the next. Uh, these, are, these are guiding principles of my life that unfortunately to some make me impossible, you know, and to others arrogant. You know, you know in Gambia, uh, it is expected, you know, if you have, you know, you have to double dog you know, generally. And if you don't double dog dangare. You know, <laughs> now my religion tells me a little the other name. You know, so I really don't do double double, but that's not because of Ray. It's just it is not me. Because I this is my belief. So some sometimes interpret that as arrogance. But it is yeah. not. That's you know? true. You know, but I hope, I really hope. Uh, that Allah, who sees all things and sees what is in my heart, will judge me fairly. Inshallah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very powerful statement there. Uh, like you said, uh, especially if you walk outside of the Gambia before, Iblis, um, 
international uh, institutions and organizations then is different when you come to Gambia because I had Kamara in his interview said oh you know to them and when I heard that I was like well why should you even be late if you're supposed to work and you're getting paid why should you be late you know you would be amazed Fatu, if you mm. ask social security and they're very open and honest with you they will tell you that we have a very disciplined office and we have a very professional office. And I have seen people who are saying, really, they are now beginning to enjoy their jobs because they are really doing something. <laughs> yeah. You know, I say to people, we, Social Security works next to um, Trust Bank, for example. It's a Gambian bank, it's a Gambian management team. We all come from about the same areas. People will tell me, oh, you have a car, that's why you're not late, we do not have a car. Not everybody in Trust Bank has a car. But I tell you, go to their banking hall at 8 o'clock. The cashiers will be in their cubicles, ready to serve. Wow. If they can do it, why not us? Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know, I know Skype. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came here for holidays, uh, she was, she went there on um, uh, what do they call this thing? Um, uh, internship. And uh, I was on holiday that time. She will drag me to get her to the office by uh, before half past seven because that is when they all have to be in the office. Wow. Those days they have to be in the office by quarter past six or something like that because they do early morning sessions or meetings. They are Gambians. Those individuals, the majority of the people working there are Gambians. You know, I'm not saying they don't go, they don't get in late, but the majority of people get in the office on time. So I don't see why we cannot do it, why it is a problem for us to do. But clearly, we want this country to move forward. We have to be willing to put in the effort to make sure we progress. If not, we will not. Yeah. Well, I just want to say um, if the government decide that they want uh, you to uh, serve again, I think uh, it would be very, very good if you can, I mean, serve because this is about the country and you are Gambian and it's not for, uh, you're not serving for an individual. I think that's very important. Uh, like you mentioned here, you're serving to the best of your ability and you're Gambian. You never sought any other passport except the Gambian one that you have. Uh, I just would like to thank you very much for taking your time to talk to us. Uh, it's almost 12 minutes to iftar here and um, you know, I'm, I'm about to prepare for iftar. Is there anything that I did not talk about that you want to uh, mention? A lot of people are watching you and some are saying they're very inspired uh, with the interview. They've listened and now they're happy to hear from you because most of the stuff that I ask, these were speculations that were on social media. So that's why I wanted us to clear this. Because, you know, when something gets on social media, it's on WhatsApp, it's in every village, it's everywhere. So uh, this is why I just wanted us to clear all of that. But is there anything that you want to say before you, you go? Uh, well, I think, like you said, um, there's another two or three interviews aligned. So maybe I will, I probably don't have to exhaust everything. Because otherwise, <laughs> I'll run out of things to say. Uh, yeah. but just to say, Fatu, thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to all your listeners. And, um, and in this very unprecedented times, just to say to everybody, uh, stay well and stay safe. Thank you. Good night. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was Mohamed Manjang, the uh, managing director, the former managing director of the Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation. He has been deployed to the Senegal Gambia Secretariat, but I'm sure you've all seen a letter that he wrote to say no, his skill set is not in there. So he has rejected that uh, position right now. I'm sure uh, we will get to know what the government is going to say because at some point they would need to reply to him to say, okay, thank you. We heard this. That's it. Or now we think you can serve in another uh, place. We're just waiting to follow up on that and see what happens with that. Uh, but just to let you all know, 
know that uh, he will be interviewed by Pamudu Bojang of Membe Kering tomorrow, and also uh, Banka Mane and Coach Pasamba Jau and Musa Jeng. That's for the people, by the people show, and that will be on Sunday. So you all can follow up on all the other interviews. Uh, like I said, Musa Jeng is getting ready for all the questions in finance, and he will be talking to uh, Mr. Manjang on uh, on sunday thank you all very much for your time i do appreciate this and inshallah we'll be back on monday far to stick as every monday and friday thank you all very much thank you